So hi everyone and welcome to Architecture in the Den with uh, me, your host, Lisa, Lisa Rains from Pride Road, the architectural practi practice franchise. Uh, so that's getting harder for me to say. Um, today, um, I'm delighted to welcome Tim Clark. So um, Tim, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, I'm um, Tim Clark, um, representing Europe on RIBA Council. Um, architect, uh, civil engineer, working in the transportation business, um, rail mainly, and um, with a lot of international experience and uh, quite a lot of um, involvement in the issues of gender inclusion and uh, and and race. Um, which, having worked in Cameroon, I feel very privileged to be <laughs> have been included in the past among um, diverse communities and um, and also um, passionately interested in raising the quality of our engagement as a profession with the world at, whole, uh, at large and um, with with the public uh, at large so that more people feel they can feel part of the um, the world of architecture that we're responsible for um, I think that that sort of gives you a little bit of a, a snapshot um, so, so Tim, I, I met you through the uh, camp for my recent failed, unfortunately, campaign for um, the RIBA National Council. Um, mm. I, I met you as, and your your role at the moment is RIBA Europe. So you hold the seat for REA, no, RIBA Europe. So how did that yep. come about? Well, it came about with, with a lot of delay, actually, which is interesting that RIBA could have had and should have had a representation in overseas regions, I can't say overseas, outside the UK, <laughs> outside the islands, if you like, um, uh, some while ago, but um, wasn't ready for it. Um, and then in 2017, decided it would add to the one international councillor role that they've had for about 20 years um, or 25 years, probably. Um, another three, which meant that we'd have one for Americas, one for Europe, one for Asia and, and uh, Australasia, and then one for Africa and the Middle East. And, and uh, these were all in place um, in 2017, except Europe, because Europe wasn't very well publicized. <laughs> Nobody knew about it. Um, this, this is something that happens very often, that, that things that are really, really important um, don't get sort of flagged up for, uh, uh, loudly enough so that the, the relevant um, interested individuals uh, aren't able to aren't able to um, participate anyway that was um, that was in 2017 to 2018 and since then we've been trying to build up a kind of participation of international members uh, and that's my passion really which is to get more people involved with our IBA and, and have more voices uh, in the process and then of course we have the process of democracy which which we need to do, go on developing within our IBA to make sure that members actually have people representing them that they voted for. Those yeah. kinds of things. Very okay. interesting so, for me. Um, so how did the numbers work? So, um, so you mentioned uh, there's a seat for Africa and Middle East. Yeah. Asia. Yeah, and Australasia, which is, you know, right down under. So it's <laughs> Asia and Australasia one seat. Yep. Ah, uh, Europe. Europe, yeah. And, and then America. Americas. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so four and four international seats. Yeah, that's right. And and what sort of proportion um um are do those members make up of the RIBA? Well, they're between um the. the Okay, the, the membership overall of RIBA is I don't know of the, is is about forty. 5,000, I think, and, and including the student component, which is quite significant, and students are able to join for, for free, yeah. and they're encouraged yeah. to do that. Student membership. Um, yeah. As well. Yeah, uh, that, that's, um, we're, we're about 50-50 students and chartered members, and a total of about 6,000 internationally. So, um, yeah. 6,000. And so how we're about... Yeah, how many seats are Europe? We've got how many how many members? Um, around thirteen to fifteen hundred. It, it varies, and they're still being chased around. 
in terms of finding out who's actually staying on as a mm -hmm. member of RIVA because you know people are finding it difficult uh, after the pandemic to focus their minds on priorities and one of them is whether they want to stay part of a membership organization and what they're getting out of it so mm. those kinds of questions are coming up now so so within europe does it split down into branches and countries should do should do um we should have we've got actually in europe uh statistically we've got seven hundred thousand architects uh believe it or not um of which uh, quite a lot are in Italy, actually. There's 60,000, I think 60,000 in Italy. And, and a lot of them are not doing architecture. A lot of them, you know, qualified in architecture, and then they went away and opened a restaurant, uh, or they became developers or whatever. I mean, this happens a lot in different, you know, different countries in different ways. Mm. Um, we have uh, 50,000, I think, in Turkey, which is also in the U European um, region. We have uh, a lot in France and Germany. These, these are major, major countries of representation, but the actual mem membership of, of, of RIBA within these countries is usually around 50 to 60 people, which is, you know, and that they're chartered members mostly mm. who, who actually come to the surface. So, 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 so statistically would, quite large. Hmm? Yeah, Sorry. So why would someone keep their, R well, join the RIBA if they were practicing in Europe? Yeah, that's a good question. Somebody, somebody in Poland wrote to me and said, well, what, what does somebody want to be a member of the Royal Institute of British Architects for mm. in Poland? You know, and, and actually this particular member who represents quite a lot of voices in, in, in Poland is, is a very dedicated member of RIBA, wants to see RIBA succeed. But he said it, it's kind of, in terms of brand recognition, it's very difficult for people outside the UK to identify with this sort of British, <laughs> British thing. <laughs> um, but um, it's it's uh, it's also you know status. People don't often know what RIBA stands for. Um, a friend of mine did a cartoon of what the various uh, letters stand for, um, which I can share privately with you, which is quite interesting. <laughs> Sometimes you know it's it's kind of entertaining to imagine how you could use the letters RIBA, but the letters RIBA nonetheless stand for a very high. Um, status in the profession internationally. Um, it's like AIA and, and AIA is the main competitor, I think, internationally. So we do have a lot of uh, leverage when we use the letters RIBA, even if many people don't recognize exactly what they stand for. It's just the, the British brand. Mm. And uh, um, we are thinking about how that might evolve. Yeah, so uh, how, how come you retain? So, so uh, where, where are you talking from at the moment? I'm talking from uh, southern Bavaria, close to the Alps, okay. on the north side of the Alps. And um, in, in front of me, through the window, the sort of uh, foothills and a bit of snow in one, one or two instances still, mm -hmm. despite the warm weather. <laughs> <laughs> and so what's, um, why have you sort of kept hold of your chartership? Have you, how, in fact, have you always been uh, RIBA, a chartered member? Well, I joined RIBA because that was the kind of path that I signed on to when I started studying architecture. And I went to Kingston and University College London, um, the Bartlett, and, um, and then I did, did my part three and quickly got registered and then um, joined RIBA. It's funny enough, it took a while for RIBA to notice that I'd applied for membership and then they voted me in about nine months later um <laughs> and then and then you know i stayed a member until i went to the university of york as a research fellow doing work on continuing education mm -hmm. in the building professions and I, I i did actually take a an ma in education while i was working there i wasn't allowed to do that part time and mm -hmm. um that made me think well actually i don't need to be a member of the ripa at the moment i'm a registered architect and i was doing work privately as an architect as well at the same time um, and I did, I think I took a break of about three or four years. And then I thought, well, um, maybe it's good to stay in touch. And I think I resumed very quickly. Um, so more or less continuously since I, I first qualified, I've been a member of the RIBA. Um, and I've always found it, you know, as a, as a member group, mm. as a member organization, very, very helpful and, and, and very welcome. In fact, the chapter level, when you have an active ch chapter, it's very, 
it can be very exciting and, and, and very informative to be among other experienced um, colleagues and, and to hear what they have to say and to bring in outside speakers to generate uh, uh, conversation, hence my passion for continuing education. But um, mm. so, it, so it has that value, definitely. Mm. So that, but that was over in the UK, I assume. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and then, yeah, so then what happened? So how long, when did you leave the UK? Well, I left the UK um, after about 15 years at the University of York in, in um, working as a research fellow and visiting professor in Belfast as well. Um, I, I sort of overlapped then with a visiting professorship in Cameroon, where my wife had started to work in the Goethe Institute. She runs the Goethe Institute. She ran the Goethe Institute there, which is a, like a British council for the German language and culture. Um, in the capital of of, 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 of Cameroon. So I, I actually got to, to have some experience of Cameroon um, at that time, which was, which was tremendous. Um, and um, that visiting professorship there uh, went on um, and, and, and continued after Claudia's work in Cameroon had ended, because I, I started to do some work for the German embassy and for NGOs over there in the rainforest. And, um, I was there for five years altogether, um, doing the doing that kind of work, and then um, then Claudia moved off to Los Angeles for her next appointment, and I thought, well, that that's that's interesting. And I actually, by coincidence, had relations with Exxon Mobil in Cameroon um, because my boss in the rainforest was playing cards poker with uh, the um, the <laughs> Exxon Mobil guy, and. Uh, he was interested in getting my input to new work that they were doing in Africa, but they needed me to have an office in America. So I, it was, I did use that coincidence to set up an office in Los Angeles with uh, a firm that was already there. And we started a partnership there in 1996. And uh, that ran through for 12 years um, until I got a job in the UK. Um, when I got my citizenship and license in, in, in California and New York, um, in the US, I, I then got, I then got appointed regional director with Atkins in, in Winchester in the UK. So I said I came back to the future, as it were, back to the UK at that time. A regional director in uh, Atkins. And yeah. Then, um, and then how long were you back in the UK for? Well, very briefly, because that was in 2008. 2007 yeah. 2008 when the big crash happened and they they closed my office um <laughs> i said to them well what are you doing this for i've just started and they, oh well you know we've got this huge financial crisis now and um but you 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 can apply for other jobs you know don't worry you know we'll find something i'm sure we'll find something and then um uh, somebody wrote to me saying would you like to be considered for a job in dubai uh, with Atkins, I, I, I wrote back immediately saying I've no interest whatsoever in going to Dubai. I think it's a poncy, horrible, overdeveloped city, which is, you know, Western, far too um, out of touch and, and so on. And I thought, well, I can't send that off. So I wrote back saying um, I'd like to um, make myself available for this and uh, be very interested to know more about it. And uh, anyway, long story short, I got the job of director of architecture for the Dubai Metro at that time, because they, mm -hmm. they moved me from Winchester then to Dubai. And mm -hmm. uh, I was down there for three or four years in the Gulf. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, then I um, oh. after Dubai, I, uh, because Dubai then, you know, had another, it, the, the, the last ripples of the crash from 2008 hit Dubai yeah. around 2010 so I I um I then moved to Doha until 2013 worked with Deutsche Bahn by, because I'd already been in the rail business in in uh, Dubai working on the metro and uh, that was a very successful and very enjoyable relationship the rail rail body of of Germany which was harnessed for doing the um metro and and long distance transportation in uh in, 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 in Doha and, and in Qatar. Um, so I was basically with them until I essentially you know, officially retired, as it were, from that kind of work. 
as an employee and I'm kind of like loose now. I'm loose in the world as an architect. <laughs> so you retired and then what? Retired? Well, I mean, you know, the, the way we, this is another thing about inclusion and diversity. Once you get to 65, people say, well, you've had it, mate. You know, that this is your, um, you're in, on a pension now you, and, 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 and that's it. And most people say, well, that's, that's fine. I'm, I'm retired now. And there's sort of a lot of people put on LinkedIn, I'm retired and enjoying it and all that kind of thing. I, I don't see it like that. I just see it as a continuation of maybe going somewhere, maybe not um, doing a job if it's um, of interest. And, and uh, I'm still very actively involved in a number of sectors, housing, uh, rail, and um, sustainable development. Are you, um, are you attached to an office or do you offer consultancy? Or I, I am an independent consultant. Right. Mm. Yeah. So how long have you been over in... Bavaria for? Well that was an overlapping appointment from about 2006 onwards um, after we were in um, California. Um, Claudia worked in Germany uh, and then and then retired herself and then I continued I was continuing working because I was able to do that um, and and um, but that was we, we, we were here from about 2007, um, um, full time in our current house. And, um, and that's what now coming up for 14 years uh, now. And um, before that, we were here in the same place on, on a job that Claudia was doing at that time. While I was working in California, I was commuting from Bavaria to California. I was commuting from all the places that she was working in after mm -hmm. after California. I was I was still in touch with California until 2007 uh, when I got the job with Atkins. Um, but you know, um, whatever I do, this is my sort of like European home, if you like. Mm, so do you but, see yourself yeah. staying in Bavaria now? Well, I, I mean, in a way. Um, Yes, uh, I'm allowed to, um, and we are living here, and this is my wife's kind of German home, if you like, but um, we have a home in England, and um, it's been very difficult to, to hang on to by fingernails, just to make sure that it's maintained and kept, and, and we rent it out, mm. um, and, and we, we, we keep part of it for ourselves, so we, 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 we actually have our foothold in the UK, and I'm still very much, you know, in the UK, um, in that sense, um, although I'm here most of the time at the moment. Well, I, I guess you'll be going back to the UK for council meetings, won't you? Well, that was that was always the case since 2018. I was going mm. to council meetings in London uh, three or four times a year, and sometimes for extra meetings as well. But since 2020, it's been you know very much okay. online. Mm. It's an interesting transmission transition with the online opportunity actually. Mm, very... Absolutely. Mm. So <laughs> that's quite a quite a career. So what would you say is like the, your most satisfying um, sort of moment or part of your career? Um, I think that anything that has been uh, difficult for other people to do that they've plunged me into taking responsibility for has always been uh, the worthwhile aspect. Um, like the Dubai Metro, for example, nobody wanted that job because they knew that the job was two or two years behind um, schedule mm. and that we were going to get into an awful lot of trouble if we didn't finish on time. So my job was to finish the first phase, the red line and part of the green line design um, on time. And uh, we, we, we did that back in 2009. And then I continued on afterwards with, with Atkins as it, as it slowly realized it had to reconfigure it, itself to cope with the new financial situation that it was in. But um, I think that, that um, also just engaging with different uh, cultures and countries, such as getting licensed in the United States, which is not easy for a Brit. You have to start all over again, do all the courses and do online examinations. I think you've got 38 hours of online examinations and you have to pass them all um, and then you you are allowed to apply for a license in individual states. And, uh, oh, right. Okay. That's not easy. Not easy. Mm. And then you know when I came over here, I got licensed in Bavaria, just at the last end of the Brexit process. Just snuck in through the you know the sort of half open door, and um, 
But that's also another separate experience, which is how we get reciprocity, how we engage with foreign um, uh, countries uh, in terms of practicing and how we work with local people and, and get over the language hurdle as well. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting. You know, when you not just um, other types of people, other, you know, cultures of working, but also the the whole business of, of, of understanding the language and culture um, mm -hmm. of a new setting. It's not just like standing back and saying, oh, I've got to be, you know, very careful about this person because they're from a different language and culture. It's just, you know, trying to get behind that and mm. be part of it. I felt very much behind that when I was in Cameroon, funnily enough, and I really had difficulty remembering that I was white uh, because, you know, you don't see yourself all the time. Mm. And, and uh, I was fascinated by the, um, di by the different kinds of ways in which I was accommodated in, in essentially a black hierarchy in, in Cameroon. But in, in Germany, there's another kind of, you know, uh, hierarchy. We are here and, and you're, you're not exactly, you know, the, the, the non-welcome person. Germany has a fantastically welcome culture, welcoming culture. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that it's different all over Europe, this, this kind of way of accepting foreigners. Um, but Germany is very well developed. And uh, I feel very much included here. And it's helped a lot to speak the language and get behind that sort of that world. So mm -hmm. it's all colorful, not just black and white. Don't understand you. Sorry, I've got to speak English. You know, that's very important. Mm. I wonder if uh, I mean it sounds like re reciprocity is is the um, sort of the way forward for the RIBA internationally. Sort of like um, mm. you know, sort of uh, the reciprocity of the of the RIBA training overseas and and vice versa. Mm. And when mm. once we've nailed that in the UK, I think. Um, I think we could see the RIBA growing and uh, being more more useful, I guess. Well, I think it can be. Um, I think the you know the big big issue is how it stands as a club or as a registration body um, because it is a club. It's not a registration body. We can't seriously practice in other countries, although we could use letters like AIA if we have less positive with the AIA which they incidentally don't allow us to do because you have to be licensed in America in at least one state in order to use the letters AIA. Um, but in, in, in England, we can, we can use RIBA letters even if we're not registered, although we're not <laughs> architects. Mm. And it's a very you know, delicate, delicate matter. So I think that we need a uniformity of approach, which we're developing at RIBA at the moment, which is very, very important um, to have dialogue with ARB, common purposes, common so, approach. And, so is um, something going on? So is something actually being discussed at council about this? There's definitely a, a, a discussion at council about it, about, um, mm. for example, about working with ARB to regulate function. Um, and and that's, that's also a double-edged sword. Regulating function means you've got to be good at it. And if you're not, you're going to get into trouble. Whereas what... I think the traditional idea was that we should be protecting function so that nobody else can do architecture other than the mm. architect. Um, and I think that there, there's, a, a, there's been an ongoing debate about that at RMBA, but we're also bringing into focus the need for a common approach between ARB and RIBA. And that's being led by, I'm on a couple of working groups that, that, that mm. support that process and, and others who've had a lot of experience in it as well. So who's involved in it? Who else is involved in that? Well, we've got a form, former secretary of the RIBA. We've got people who are working um, on, who have been on the RIBA, on, on the ARB board, uh, mm. people from the RIBA board. I mean, we've got a good mixture of experience and knowledge there. That, um, and the people who've had experience like me, for example, internationally, mm. we know where, you know, registration sits in terms of, you know, membership of RIBA or, or other uh, architectural professions globally. And we have an alliance of about 12 or 13 um, high level institutes all over the world, including Australia, Japan, America, and, and, and others that, that we're close to uh, as, a, as, a, as a professional body. The RIBA has friends and, and, and allies in these, in these institutions, but we still have to get over the hurdle of, of, of registration if we're gonna do anything serious. And then, 
another country. And mm. my campaign, which I'm promoting, is to get people to work as partners together mm. so that you, you would you would automatically, as an RIBA member, you'd have access to the network of RIBA members all over Europe, mm. whom you could ask, um, you know, do you know any local people who could help us with this library that we just got landed with and could mm. they act as an architect of record, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so if um, we have <clears throat> sort of diverse listenership here, so if you if we were, if you had one piece of advice to give to an architectural student, mm -hmm. uh, what would it be? I'd say embrace as much of the curriculum as you can. Don't go in just thinking that it's going to be, um, you know, adorable because it's creative and artistic and you don't need to know all the other stuff. It's actually the whole body of, of RIBA uh, uh, courses, architectural education, is to embrace the broad um, uh, remit of, of the architect and, 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 and enjoy it and, and find ways to associate with people who, who enjoy whatever it is you can't enjoy at the moment and, 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 and get some of the um, glow from them, if you like, because you know, I had a good structures lecturer at uh, university when I first started architecture um, who inspired a lot of um, you know interest in that area and also simplified a lot of things that I'd previously learned in that same field um, and and also people who can really talk about design and, and, and um, I'd say get close to people that you like to work with in this field and and and, and st stoke up your enjoyment factor in as many different aspects as possible so that you can you can benefit from that later on because it, you, you get launched into practice after completing your course and you, you, you need to be ready for that in as many different ways as possible. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think um, that conversation went very quickly and um, I'm gonna draw <laughs> to a close. Anything, one yeah. last thought that you'd like to... Uh... Well, I'd just like to um, uh, encourage you to do more of these. I think it's a fantastic um, um, conversational uh, platform on which uh, people can, you know, put put forward put forward valuable experience and ideas. And I think it would help to um, uh, inform the the broader profession to to have access to this. Maybe snippets of these things uh, rather than whole whole videos <laughs> they're, they're they're widely available <laughs> on youtube and spot freely available on youtube and spot yeah that's, that's really good <laughs> if that's anyone's really good listening to get in contact um, very very much enjoyed um talking to you about this uh, lisa and we we are looking forward to having you on RIBA council as soon as possible as soon as possible <laughs> maybe next year maybe next yeah. year look forward to supporting that process Oh, thank you very much. So yeah. um, thanks everyone for listening to Architecture in the Den. If you've um, enjoyed uh, listening, uh, we're available on YouTube and uh, Spotify. So please subscribe. And if you want to get in contact or join me as a guest, please uh, check out my website, prideroadfranchise.co.uk and um sort of you can email me on lisa at prideroad.co.uk so thank you very much tim for coming on welcome thank you i can't find the stop record button oh there it is okay thanks tim <laughs> bye <laughs>